Because if the economy in Nigeria is to grow and do so rapidly and sustainably, then it's going to rely, have to rely on private capital. And the question is, are we as a nation actually committed to private capital? It's an important question. And that particular question gets answered in part when you ask what for me is the second question. What role will the price mechanism play in Nigeria's economic arrangements? As of now, it's not clear to what extent Nigeria is willing, at the very least, to tolerate a price mechanism that moves us away from some of the opaqueness that we have seen in the past year. For me, these two questions are very, very important to answer. If we don't assign a role to private capital, then we will not protect cap private capital. If we don't protect private capital, then we will not get private capital. End of story. If the price mechanism isn't allowed to work and work properly, then resource allocation will continue to be suboptimal and outcomes thereafter cannot attain the levels that we wish. Therefore, in the context of innovating our way out of a recession, we will come out of a recession. I think that is now, that we will come out of a recession is not now seriously an interesting point. It is whether we will grow rapidly and sustainably, or we will simply chug along at a rate of growth that is suboptimal. Don't forget, for as long as Nigeria grows at any rate that is less than 3%, then it means that income per head in this economy is still declining. Why? Population growth is just short of 3%. And so that's really a major, major challenge. We need to grow. We need to grow rapidly. We need to grow sustainably. We need to grow inclusively. I worry about international policy. And at this point, international monetary policy is certainly perhaps the most important. Let's take where the, very, the four factors are likely to go. Or, and we'll see where they have gone thus far. International policy. The Fed has already advised, long ago, a tightening. We still expect to see further tightening this year. Why does that concern us? Well, it concerns us for two, two reasons at the very least. First, what happens to the US dollar? A continually strong dollar is what we're seeing and what we're expecting. And second, don't expect that a strong uh, rising US interest rates will have no implications for funds inflows into Nigeria. Indeed, for my money, it's one of the fundamental challenges that we are going to have to deal with. As far as international trade is concerned, it's about oil. It's been good so far, at least compared to what we had seen in 2016. Problem is, we are beginning to see what may be increased volatility. Predicting oil price is, I've always maintained, a mug's game, and I'm not interested. But what I am interested in is to ask a question. What will happen to the various reforms that we are trying to put in place if, or I would argue, when oil prices begin to, when oil prices begin to ease? We are, and we are beginning to see oil prices ease. If you look at activity, we seem to have turned the corner. Oil growing, even though the last GDP number suggests that Nigeria is still shrinking, but the rate of shrinkage much, much reduced. The prospects don't look that bad, however, there are a couple of things that I think I need to draw your attention to. The first is that this economy remains very concentrated 
Because when we talk about innovating our way out of recession, Nigeria is pretty much out of recession. If it doesn't happen, in, if the numbers don't reflect that in Q2, they will certainly reflect that in Q3. But the challenge is not coming out of a recession. That's too limited a challenge or too limited an ambition. What's more interesting is what happens to us once the numbers show the positive that we are looking for. If you look at this, what Nigeria is, is an economy dependent on six major sectors. There are 46 in the GDP numbers, but we're dependent on six. Six of them are 80% of total output. Agriculture is about 23%, and that's the largest sector. The second largest sector is trading, which is about 17. So you're already 40% done. Beyond trading is telecoms, which is about 11. Then you have oil and gas, which is nine. You have manufacturing, which is 10. Real estate, which is somewhere around about seven. And that's our, that's our economy gone. So one of the big challenges around our innovation out of a recession is how do we continue to grow those drivers, those output drivers for the economy? Because right now, we are still a very concentrated, output concentrated economy. If you look at the issues around costs, again, a lot of noise around inflation coming down. But I caution that please be mindful of how you interpret the inflation numbers. Yes, inflation is down 16.3. But look at the month-on-month -month numbers, and they continue to rise. And those rising month-on-month -month numbers are actually telling us something, because those are the more recent reflectors of where costs are. Costs rising for Nigeria puts us at a competitive disadvantage. Please let us understand that. You cannot have Nigeria's inflation at 16% when Africa's inflation is somewhere around about 55 6% on average. That creates a major competitive disadvantage for Nigeria. Let me add to this, that at 16%, anything beyond 12% in terms of inflation is very bad for Nigeria. Why? It actually adversely affects economic growth. So we've got to rein back inflation if we are going to do if we are going to sustainably grow this economy. Beyond that, what are the other elements of cost? Oh yes, I shouldn't forget the exchange rates. Ah yes, finally Nigeria has made it. We are 300 and I think it's 73 on NAFEX. But don't forget again, we've got about six, or is it five exchange rates from 305 through to about 370 or thereabout. The person I feel most in sympathy with is the Honorable Minister of Finance. Because I keep wondering how much her revenue profile would improve if you had a consolidated exchange rate and it was really market determined. Everybody says they would like interest rates to come down. And that, of course, is the third leg of the cost profile. You want interest rates to come down. Forgive me, I'm a university academic. Interest rates, from what they taught us and what we teach, are driven by three things. First, the balance of demand and supply. Second, the risk of asset erosion, which is inflation. And third, the project risks or the risk to, of the economy generally. Let's deal with all three. Ah risk of asset erosion. If inflation is 16% and you want interest rates to come down, then you've got to think about bringing inflation down. If the biggest borrower or the most secure borrower is borrowing at somewhere between 14 and 18%, and by the way, why, I wonder, should the same government issue instruments of the same tenure at different rates? Uh, just in case you hadn't figured it out. DMO, 90 days, 14%. Central Bank, 90 days, 18%. Interesting, and I wonder why. But the key point for me is that imagine you had an exchange rate into market determined. The government could actually borrow externally, taking pressure off the domestic market. But it would then funnel 
its borrowings back into the domestic currency market, enabling the currency not just to stabilize, but perhaps to even appreciate. And so there are still some dissonances within our policy environment that we need to take account of and we need to deal with. Failure to deal with these really will create